Just in case you still don't know me, I'm Ping Su. I'm the interim dean of the college. Uh, today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Mr. Daniel Lewin. Um, he's the corporate vice president, technology and civil engagement at Microsoft. Uh, Mr. Lewin got his AB degree in, in politics from Princeton University and has been a Silicon Valley based ex executive for more, more than 30 years. Some of his career highlights include leading the initial Macintosh higher education launch for Apple Computer, his role as a founder of Next Incorporate. Next. Do you guys know Next? Yes. Very good. Uh, leading sales and marketing for Go Corporation. Before joining Microsoft, he was the CEO of, of Origin Systems for five years. He joined Microsoft in 2001 as the vice president in charge of global engagement with startups, venture capitalists, and industry partners. His current VP role in technology and civil engagement has him supervising campaign technologies, environmental sustainability, uh, policy-oriented academic outreach, and university relations. He also has the executive and site responsibility for the Mountain View campus. Once again, please help me welcome Mr. Daniel Lewin from Microsoft. I don't mean that. Yeah, thank you. Why, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Um, so I'm going to start off by inviting you all to be thinking while I'm talking and, and um, encourage uh, questions. Because at the end of the day, I'd prefer to know what's on your mind and see if I can help provide some perspective uh, on things that matter to you. Um, ideally, my talk will put in context the kinds of things that uh, I find interesting at the moment. and. Um, uh, but you don't really have to re restrain your questions to the specifics or the ideas that I'm going to share in this presentation about civic engagement. Um, if you're interested in anything uh, that might tie to my accumulated experiences here in Silicon Valley, uh, when you say more than 30 years, we were chatting on the way here, it's actually been 40 years since I moved here uh, after I graduated from college. So you can do the math on how old I am, uh, more or less. And, uh, and so I've, I've seen a lot of change and interesting things in Silicon Valley going back to 1976. Uh, and there's a, just a wealth of opportunity for all of you uh, as you move forward with your background in engineering and your community here in San Jose and in the greater Bay Area or just in general in the tech industry. So anything that's on your mind on any of those things, I'm happy to, to work with and, and respond to. Um, as was um, mentioned in the introduction, um, I have this wonderful position inside of Microsoft. It was created about three years ago by my boss, uh, Brad Smith, who's the president of the company. Uh, he works for Satya Nadella, who's the new CEO. Um, in the old world, before I went to work for Brad, I used to work in Satya's world. Um, so I couldn't be more excited about what's going on, both inside of Microsoft, but also in the industry. Um, it's an exceptional time. Um, in the technology industry at this moment in time. There are so many problems and issues uh, on a global basis in the world, from climate, uh, making cities livable, um, in general how technology is going to help people of all abilities, um, how we're going to be affecting climate change over time and how technology plays a role in that. I guess the essence of it is that there aren't really any problems in society where technology isn't going to be an integral part of the solution. Um, we've reached that stage. And so part of this conversation um, is going to be tied to the work that I get to oversee inside of the company, um, which is to understand the market conditions, what's going on in the world, and I'll describe a little bit about how we do that and where we do that. Um, and then to put all of the company's energy in a very focused way, like a lens, like a magnifier, on some illustrative examples that we can work with the community. And that means the whole community, and I'll describe that a little bit, um, to help solve these problems. Because this is not 
a moment in time where any one entity, not Microsoft alone, not Google alone, not anybody else alone, can solve the problems that we all see where technology can be part of the solution. And so um, this whole notion of civic engagement is a movement that has begun over the last few years. Uh, what we did inside the company is to take, as I said, sort of a very high-level view out of the president's office, and we organized our effort around a half a dozen cities in the United States. If you haven't noticed, um, people are moving to cities. Uh, it's crowded. <laughs> um, if you look on a global basis, we've reached a tipping point where more than half of the global population lives in a mar large metropolitan area now for the first time ever in human existence, and it's just accelerating. Um, and as a result of that, the civil infrastructure, the city infrastructures are crumbling. Uh, you can see it even here in the US um, where parts of major cities are falling apart, whether it's potholes or bridges need repair and all those kinds. So there's physical infrastructure, but there's also issues associated with traffic um, that correlate to health. If you look in really large metropolitan areas around the world, um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, for example, there's huge health problems in the core of the inner city in Sao Paulo. Um, and the issue is the logistics, the movement of fresh food to the center of the city, it's so clogged up, they can't move goods into the center of the city. So there's all kinds of things. So when you think about self-driving cars and you think about logistics and transportation, there are lots of interesting problems. There are lots of ways that technology is going to be helpful. So what we did uh, is we looked at a half a dozen cities. We picked um, some really large cities. They're all actually pretty large cities. Um, but Chicago and New York, as you might imagine, Chicago has been very progressive with making their data available. I'll talk a little bit about that. But obviously San Jose is on the list. San Francisco is on the list. It's in our backyard, and those are important. So we're doing things here that we'll talk about. Um, and I want to make it clear that um, as I walked into the building, there are some projects that probably some of you are already involved in, this particular one called the Paseo Prototyping Festival and Challenge. Who's playing? Who's going to do something there? Anybody? Well, my understanding is there are hundreds of you who have already signed up. So those of you who haven't taken a look at it should. It's an opportunity to understand this. And if you'd like to apply some of your energy against um, participating, because this is a world where everyone's got to do their part. Uh, and if you want to do that, it's one that Microsoft and Intel and others are involved with um, to help sponsor that and make it a, an opportunity for all of you. So that's sort of a quick uh, setup for you. So civic tech, um, basically the use of technology for the public good. Uh, there's always been um, technical advancement that made civil society function better. Going back to I mean, the Romans figured out how to move water around and had sewer systems and plumbing systems. But it wasn't until we had interconnected piping that was tool in a way that you could go off the shelf and build these things that we got massive urban infrastructure. And the beautiful thing about what's happened in the tech industry in the last 10 or 15 years is that the World Wide Web has blossomed on top of the internet. And that lets for this interoperability to occur and it lets the data, the information, move using these industry standard protocols between and among the different technology stacks that all the big companies have built over the years. So Microsoft has its view, Google has a view, Facebook has a view, Oracle has a view. All the different companies have built up these technology infrastructure stacks with the application layer that helps the cities and businesses and city governments and all of you at the application layer use word processors and spreadsheets and things like that to create things. But what's going on in civic tech right now is it's this interoperability and the network and the web and the ability to take information and move it around in a coordinated way that is making magic occur. And it's a set of ingredients that come about from public-private partnerships. And by that, I mean that the cities, in many cases, set the regulations by which the information can be used. There are security and privacy considerations from the utilities about information about water flow or electricity or sewer systems and gas and piping that run around in the cities and make all that work. The information about those systems is mission-critical infrastructure 
which has regulatory responsibility. So those operators have rules by which people can see that data. But if you don't expose that data in an interesting and new way and combine it with other information, perhaps the high-rise building that is operated by a building owner and operator, and there are heating thermostats in every room in the building, there are city rules by which those temperatures need to be coordinated. In cold parts of the country, temperature can't go below 65 in an apartment in a tall building. Well, what happens if it goes below 65? That's when people pick up the phone and they call the city and say, hey, my landlord is not turning the heat on. Well, guess what? With lights, weight, little sensors, you can put sensors and a little mesh network in the building, and you can actually find the controls, because it's not built into the old systems that were put there a long time ago. And you can find out what's going on. Maybe the boilers and the furnaces are actually on, but the person in the apartment above is on vacation and left the window open, and it's drawn all the, all the heat out of the building. Now, you would know that if you had a sensor in the room where there was no one, who wasn't complaining, even though that apartment was ice cold, and you're below it and it's drawing the heat out of your room. So how would you know those things? And how quickly would the city respond to that phone call when you made the phone call, where the rule is the temperature's got to be 65, but it's really 55 in your room? The landlord's trying to do the right thing. So how do you make those kinds of problems you know, surface, and how do you attack those problems without these public-private partnerships and experimentation where people come together and look at the problem, identify some of these little interesting opportunities, and then scale them. And what comes forth from that are interesting new small businesses, sometimes startup companies that are venture capital backed and they can scale. And so this is an area where what we try and look for is an increased engagement of local community, students, universities, government officials. City of San Jose is very progressive. We've got a terrific new mayor and Mayor Licardo. Very, very aggressive open data, business intelligence, commitment to building dashboards and seeing the information, partnering with industry to make these things happen. This is the 10th te largest city in the United States, as you probably know. And so it's an important test ground. And so we're looking for these experiments and these projects like this one that's the Paseo Prototyping Festival is a good example of a place where you can go get involved and start to understand these things. Because frankly, there's real work to be done and there are jobs to be had over time in this space. So it's something for you all to be thinking about. So it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that's just a few years old, although the notion of technology in cities, if I go back to the plumbing comments about, okay, when did you have you know, the normalization of the pipe fittings where you could just go down to the plumber and say, okay, I one and a quarter inch pipe and I need a whatever fixture. Okay, great, they all work together. So those things were there a long time ago. Now we're talking about the data flows and different kinds of problems. So those are the interesting things that we see. So if you look at the broader set of issues, um, you know, there are these, these urban living patterns. Um, and we've been surveying and working with a number of national scale organizations. Um, there's one called Code for America. Uh, which is based here in the Bay Area, and it was the brainchild of a woman named Jen Palka, who was the assistant chief technology officer in the White House uh, and for, the, for the president's office. Um, and they're in Oakland now is where they're set up and in, 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 in San Francisco. And um, they've got these brigades, and there's a brigade here in San Jose of people who care about using this open data, the city data, uh, and the government-related data. Uh, and um, they're trying to attack the choke points or the difficult spots in the system uh, to make it so that these public goods and services are connected and work well together. They've got some very interesting large-scale projects that start to deal with issues around access to food stamps, people who are in a position where they need public assistance but don't have a way to actually navigate the web to get there, or you can't really dial the 800 number or the 408 number to get in and, because the systems are clogged because there's so many people. They don't have the awareness for those things. So doing a diagnostic on how the technology layers and the systems and those that could be helpful and shedding a light on making it easier for those programs to be delivered to people in need 
those become, again, interesting civic tech kinds of problems where, again, all of you can apply your technical skill and your areas of interest and, and be involved. So what we did inside of Microsoft is, again, is we created this technology and civic engagement group. And we've dedicated a couple of people to each of the cities that we're involved in. Kevin and Jessica are down there in the front row on the team, and they're dedicated to San Jose. Um, and we're identifying these problems and patterns and then bringing the partners together and helping sponsor and coalesce these kinds of ecosystem projects where the identification of the problem uh, is the cornerstone and then people can come together and hack or attack the problem in an interesting way with a goal of finding something that will be scalable that a company like ours can then share among our broad network. I mean, we're, we're a company of 100,000 people. We do business in every country on the planet uh, virtually. Um, and we have an initiative to do work in metropolitan areas all over the world. Um, and as we identify with these exceptional resources in these smaller number of cities, interesting things and problems that can scale, um, you know, magic can happen because then all of a sudden people start to share this in an open source kind of way, which is, which is part of how all of this comes together, open data, open government, and then in general using cloud services so that there's no administrative infrastructure cost to housing the data, analyzing the data, presenting the information to the users and to the decision makers who can change policies as appropriate. Because in many cases, um, the challenge may not be the technology, that's not the hard part. The challenge may be that there's a regulatory barrier, but the mayor or the city council or whoever can change those barriers, they won't know unless they see it. And they don't see it unless you organize the data in a way that they can see, oh, here's the problem. Then they can make the change. So we think about civic engagement in light of the technical issues, the business, because people don't do things for free, people need to be employed, the laws, because you have to do it within the existing laws of personal privacy and security and mission critical infrastructure for society, whether it's again the electrical grid or things like that. Public opinion, and then the new regulations that come about when public opinion surfaces. So that means people need to be involved. Civil society, next generation people like you who are technically savvy and sophisticated you need to stick your nose under the tent and say, okay, where are the problems and how can I help? And you can apply this to your schoolwork and at the end of the day, there'll be real opportunities in real work in the industry to help target and solve these problems. So we look at those five areas, again, technology, business, law, public opinion, and then the new regulations that will bring these things about. And they're all tied to problems that exist in society, in metropolitan areas, and in these big ecosystems. And they get clustered around housing problems and access to affordable housing. They get clustered around logistics and transportation and movement. I know the, the university is doing projects with the city and there's great opportunity to continue that. Most every city of any scale have research institutions with important contributions to make. And so, again, you all can be part of that. The challenges, of course, um, are immense, and um, at the same time, we have to start somewhere. And so this movement's alive, and it's underway, and again, we're a, we're a big stimulator of that. I've talked around this uh, a little bit, but I want to dwell for just a moment and you know, make the point that you know, this does uh, emanate from civil society. And we have civil society because particularly in the US, we're a nation of laws and there are some level of regulations and there are customs. But on the previous slide you saw we've got immigration and diversity issues and things of all, uh, of all types. Um, in the modern world, um, most of us, at least people of my generation, think about computing mostly as automation of rational tasks, which is to say you can put your finger on a keyboard and you can type characters out that form words that become sentences, that become paragraphs, that become a paper. So what have you done? You've automated the process of taking a pen and paper or pencil and paper and writing something out to a keyboard where what you see on the screen is what you get when you print. So you're automating a rational task. Okay, I'm thinking and I'm writing. You're automating a rational task when you take numbers and you do multiplication or division or you do some derivative work and you use a spreadsheet. You're just using 
a calculator to do something that you could do with your finger in a sand or a stick or chalk on a board. Similarly with PowerPoint or any of the presentation systems, you're taking pictures so that you can use pictures to illustrate concepts. And so again, all rational tasks where you go to the system and you put things in, and then you get some efficiency on the other side in terms of how you reorganize it, how quickly you can recalculate, if you want to change the colors or the shapes, very easy to do. That's great. In the world of data-centric computing, where the data and the sensors are everywhere, traffic light sensors, watching traffic flow across cities, sensors that instrument new buildings so that you know, again, when the heat's on, you know if the fire extinguishers are alive or if they need to be serviced. You know if something's going on in the cafeteria when things need to be emptied as opposed to sending trucks around even when the bins aren't, don't need to be emptied, et cetera. So the efficiency that can be done on these things. We've taken our company and looked at these problems and said, we can't be in a position to talk to people about how to organize or to invite people to a party to attack a problem, like be a sponsor for this Paseo effort that's going on here on the campus. We can't do that unless we've looked at our own infrastructure and understood the problems and where the efficiencies can be gained. So if you want to see an example of this, you can go up to the web and you can use your favorite search engine. There you go. And you can type in 88 acres, 88 eight acres, like an acre of land. 88 acres is the primary campus that we have in Redmond, Washington. And we instrumented 88 acres with sensors. And now in our cafeterias, we're not using trucks to ship lettuce in so that everybody can have fresh salad at the salad bar. We're growing the lettuce in the buildings and micro farming so we don't have to have trucks driving around and burning fuel to do that. We're not sending people around to look at the fire extinguisher sensors anymore. We've got a central control panel making that happen. We're a carbon neutral company, which is to say we study all of our energy consumption from when I get on a plane to when you spin up a server or turn on your PC at your desktop or wherever you're working from, to how our buildings are lit and our parking lots are lit in the, in the night and in the evenings. We look at all of our energy consumption. Our data centers are massive consumers of, of electricity. And for the last five years, we have been carbon neutral, which is to say that we tax ourselves. We literally create an internal market. We're not pricing carbon on the open market. We create an internal market, our total energy consumption, by the co and we buy offsets and bring renewable sources, solar, wind, water, hydro, onto the grid to offset our carbon energy usage. And there are regulatory regimes, again, government-sponsored, that are called RACs that allow us to actually purchase certificates to guarantee that when we do this, that we're actually retiring the carbon by bringing on non-carbon-based energy production onto the grid. Globally, we are carbon neutral. We're the only company in the world that have done this. We've shared the models by which we do it. It's all up on the web. You can go look at it. We started it seven years ago. And so we said to ourselves, if we're going to do this, if we're going to play in the world of bringing together citizens, partnering with government, having nonprofits help finance some of these things, getting the foundations involved, having universities, encourage students to attack problems in this area, have it be integrated into the curricula as appropriate, work with startups and incubators, and then bring all of our partner companies along with us. Because so much of our business is tied to large enterprises using our databases and our cloud services and our business intelligence software and all of those things. If we can't help them understand how they can help themselves to do the same things, the planet will blow up, right? At the end of the day, you know, you, you read about it every day, whatever news or however you get your news. You know, we got lots of those large scale issues. And, and, and we think industry has a really important role to play. And it requires this collaborative model. And so one of the things that we as a company are particularly good at is working with a partner ecosystem. And so this is the model that we're building. And I just want to use that as an example of things that when we come to the table, we're doing it having done our homework. Um, but we don't know the problems locally. We know there are local regulations. Every city's got their own regulations. They've got their own rules. Can you go right on red? You know, those, everybody's got their own stuff. So you have to attack these problems locally. 
but the patterns emerge over time, and it's from those that we, we will scale these and share them around the world. So that's an exciting thing for us as well. So there's a particular project that we um, recently uh, helped finance uh, with a global nonprofit called Data Kind. You can find them on the web too. And it's a collection of data scientists um, who are typically trained um, uh, at very high levels, many of them are PhDs, in data science. And the guy that started it, Jake, um, is a PhD in whatever, machine learning, data science from UCLA, who said to himself, um, you know, I could go to work for Google and be a data scientist or Facebook or Microsoft, they'll hire me in a minute. But there are problems that need to be solved and maybe I could make the algorithms a little better inside of a big company for how their stuff works. But I want to actually look at these social problems. And so he started Datakind and built this community of data scientists who are willing to volunteer against these kinds of problems. And I had dinner with him about two and a half years ago um, and was totally taken by his passion and, and, and energy uh, against this problem. And so over time, um, we partnered around this Vision Zero project, which again, you can, you can take a look at. Um, and the problem was tied to really understanding um, traffic uh, pedestrian accidents and fatalities. Started in Scandinavia, um, I think it was Sweden, it may have been Denmark, but I think it's Sweden, I'm getting a nod on that one. And, um, and we got going by helping um, finance some data scientists who could who, again, understand what are the sources of information that are available. And we started in three cities, New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco, and we're running a project here in San Jose, although it's not directly tied to this, but we're actually doing the same thing here in San Jose, both because the, the mayor is particularly uh, progressive and aggressive on that, and Kevin uh, is particularly smart about these things. He worked in the city infrastructure as well, and so we wanted to make sure that we did something in one of our model cities, and that's San Jose is one of them. And you know, the idea is to understand from all the sources, the traffic signals, the physical layout of the intersections, the types of behaviors and accidents that occurred based upon the, you know, the, the miles per hour, how, how fast were people actually traveling, how many cars were moving through those intersections at different moments in time. You see these major intersections where you've got all this information because the signals are all controlled and there's a database behind the traffic signals. You've got the traffic fatalities and the accident reports and information from the EMT and the fire department and the police department that show up, so you get all that data. So what are the instrumentation issues? What data sources can be required? And what are the correlations as you take a look at that that bring forward some insight on how to redesign these intersections in a particular way where these accidents don't happen? And so the vision is there will be zero pedestrian fatalities at any intersection anywhere in the world when we get this right. But let's go figure out in a few places how to redo that. Because most cities get one chance, at least in a lifetime of most humans, to retool and think about these problems. If you've got a really bad intersection where these problems occur, how do you know what to do to make it better? How do you know? How do you really know? And you need the data. And so again, these kinds, this is a high level and a, and a, and a, and a really interesting experiment. Initial design was done. In a, in a small country, if you will, that had some model behaviors. Again, more of a homogeneous you know, culture, if you will, in the Scandinavian community. But they really looked at it and said, we can do better. And so we're taking this one forward, applying data science to that kind of a problem. So the problem space is superb. Uh, it's infinite. <laughs> and, and this is just one, I think, particularly interesting example where we've done some things that we think um, will turn into a, a scalable toolkit that we can then share. Uh, and then any city um, where there's a little brigade of Code for America hackers who want to do interesting things or a little startup company that wants to help the city do some interesting projects or even just the city departments. Um, part of how we've gone about our work is to hire some civic tech fellows. And we've done that from your community, from San Jose State. We've had a couple um, on board uh, who've done projects with us over the course of a semester. I don't know if there's anybody in the audience. I'm guessing maybe not. Um, but I know the city of San Jose recently, is Kevin, who, 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 who did they? Andrew. Andrew um, got a job. 
work in the city center. So he's inside and he's going to be doing these kinds of projects. So again, there's an opportunity um, through, again, whether it's with Microsoft or other companies. I think we're all thinking about these things, but this is, again, how we're approaching it. Um, so as we take a look at the, you know, sort of the, the real world when you go beyond a couple of these individual projects and things, um, it's, it's really a combination of the human issues or starting with the market. What are the problems that affect humans? You know, as I said in Sao Paulo, it was, there's a lot of issues, health issues in the inner city, and then they do a diagnostic on why is that so and why is it accelerating? And some of it relates to diet. And then they actually look more closely and find out that actually actually the food's just rotting on the trucks because they can't get it. So, so there's all kinds of ways to think about the human problem first and then back out what kinds of information and collections and what kind of data science can be helpful to make those things happen. So we're particularly excited about this. Um, hopefully I've, I've stimulated you know, a little bit of thinking on your part. Uh, about this, and if you've got passion for these things, it's you know your enthusiasm and internal energy, the stuff that wakes you up in the morning um, that we want to capture, and I know that the community wants to capture. Um, and it's 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 pleasantly surprising as I travel around and visit these different cities, and I'm involved in these various and different projects, um, to see that everywhere in the world that you go. And for a long time, I was doing. Uh, a lot of international work in the last couple of years has just been in the U.S. because we're trying to figure out these models and then scale them for the company around the world. Um, but the entrepreneur uh, dynamic that exists here in Silicon Valley is blossoming everywhere in the world. Uh, and I spent my first 12 years at Microsoft, I've been there about 16, 15 and a half. The first 12 years I spent working with the venture capital community here in Silicon Valley to start and then everywhere else around the US, and then from there into Europe, into the big cities, into Israel, and then everywhere around the world, China and, and Singapore, everywhere, Malaysia, they're everywhere, Australia. Um, so these pockets are bubbling up, and, and what we see is uh, a combination of, I'd say, the people being starstruck by the multi-billion dollar startup companies that oftentimes blossom here in, in Silicon Valley, or there's quite a few of them in China these days. In India, they're starting to bubble up as well. But it really is, in many cases, small businesses, you know, a small organized group of people who can build a really interesting, sustainable business that can be very profitable without venture capital when you really look locally at the kinds of problems and opportunities that exist. And so getting inside of the civic tech movement will give you insight into those kinds of problems that you know, in society will help and then make change and then can be scaled. And, and, and I think you'll see more and more of this uh, happening um, everywhere in the world over the next five to 10 years. Um, and this is really the start. So it's really about making changes that you'll all live with. Um, and um, so to the extent you, you want to be involved, I'll close uh, and then I'll open up for questions by just pointing you back to where I started, which is that there's good stuff going on here in your town, in this university, and we'll encourage you to take a look at that. I noticed the posters nicely littered on the wall uh, in the buildings as I walked through uh, to come to the auditorium here today. So um, that's about 20, 30 minutes of overview of things that I'm interested in and working on. Um, I'm all yours uh, in terms of the kinds of questions that you might have. Uh, can be anything you like. Um, we as a company made an announcement um, just yesterday uh, alongside of Google and Facebook and, and IBM and, and uh, uh, one, one other, I think I can't remember, maybe Amazon, uh, around artificial intelligence um, and principles and tenants by which the industry wants to uh, bring forward these large machine clusters that will augment uh, human capability um, by learning uh, through these neural, large-scale neural nets uh, how to behave and do interesting things. Um, and so, you know, any any topic is fair game. I'll close with that. All right? Great. Do we have a mic for any questions? 
your hand. Got one in the front, right over here. Hi. Yep. Um, so when you take on a global project, uh, are your solutions like, are they dynamic in that they change to fit the cultures of the countries you go to? That's a good question, and I'm sure everybody got the context, which is just cultural relevance to many of these things. Um, there's always a local tuning. Um, a lot of what we do in the civic tech space um, is tied to, um, I think the slide gave some frame of reference, to physical infrastructure um, and transportation systems and things of that. So there are typically local regulations that vary city to city in the United States. And frankly, when you say the United States, it is not. It's 50 states, right? So it's complicated in Puerto Rico. And you know, so it's, it, every, every locale is, is, is different. Um, we see patterns um, in big metropolitan areas around the country where the mayors and the communities have been very progressive in wanting to solve particular problems. And so Mexico City has been particularly aggressive and, and uh, proactive. Barcelona, there's things going on in Shanghai. Chicago in the U.S. has been the most progressive in putting their data sets up and out publicly. And it's a big, big city. Uh, with old physical infrastructure, um, at the same time, uh, a great business community and a, and a good local um, social community, if you will. Um, it's, it's a little uh, sort of Midwestern, if you will. I just was there yesterday, actually. And, and um, you know, Atlanta, with Georgia Tech sitting there, San Jose, the mayor is, is again, Mayor Licardo is terrific. So the civic tech movement tends to tie more to the regulatory and legal structures as opposed to the culture, but culture is always present. Um, and um, you certainly see that uh, in, in, uh, in how people go about using systems. Um, and the Chinese startups are really good examples of that, where they mirror the behavior patterns of the Chinese culture and they may or may not play as well here and vice versa. The U.S. companies may or not you know, play as well there. But I would say in general it's more regulatory complication than it is culture, in, 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 at least in civic tech per se. That's a good question though, thanks. Another one over there in the far left, my left. Hi, Mr. Levin. Hi, everyone. My name is Sakit. I'm a graduate student from computer engineering. So when considering your experience like in more than 30 years, you mm -hmm. might have experienced like more than two recessions in the economic markets, right? I, I'm trying to make uh, one link between the civic tech and its happenings to the economic condition of the global, global system. Like uh, there are certain cities who, and certain countries who might have gone into their local depressions and local recessions. Yeah. How would, and most of them being public and private partnerships, how would uh, how is the civic movement going to influence such kind of situations? And considering there are situations, like at least in the forthcoming two years, that we could expect a recession again. So let me see if I understand your question. So the, the question is, there are places in the world where there's difficult you know, e economic issues, say, in, in Spain, you know, 50% of the people under the age of 25 are unemployed. Or what, I mean, I mean, just societies that are having huge difficulties. The immigration problem, you saw that up there on the chart as well. It's just countries, Germany, other countries, you know, dealing with large influx of, of immigration as a result of the strife in, the, in, in, in certain parts of the world. And so how are we seeing the, the the, the civic tech movement being supportive of that, or how is it being financed, is the, the question? I wasn't sure, sorry. Uh, f uh, money's not the thing, like how is your goal, um, and how is the goal of achieving a civic tech, like solving a problem, like affordable housing or employment, oh, or something sure. like that, can be addressed in such kind of situations? Yeah, in many cases, it's just seeing what the issues are. Um, the, uh, we're working with, um, I can't remember the name of the, the transportation. Um, there's housing, ordinance, and zoning issues associated with the number of parking spaces required when you build a multi-dwelling unit, for example. Um, and 
you know, the model by which the regulation was built is, you know, for every bedroom there needs to be, you know, 1.2 car parking spaces, if you will, right? So how do you correlate that to access to public transit and make it so that the housing can be more dense because a typical apartment dweller uses public transportation because you've got new data that associates, if you live close to, people will pay more to live close to public transportation and you, you start to see those patterns. So we're using data science to help show and illustrate to government officials and regulators that they can actually change the regulation to make it so you can have, instead of you know nine units, you could actually have 14 units in that same physical space because you don't need the parking anymore because the behavior pattern is the following and you rent to people under certain conditions, right? So, so some of it is just seeing what's possible and knowing where the regulations get in the way. Um, Yes. And that, that could also be a major controversy. Exactly. So it's understanding the regulations, the public opinion that says, look, I don't, you know, I don't want any more cars. I just want more mass transit. I live in the city. I work in the city. I play in the city. And when I need to rent a car, I'm going to use a zip car. I'm going to use an Uber. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. I don't want to pay for car insurance. I mean, many of you are probably thinking that way. It's like, why would I do that if I was going to live in a metropolitan area? So part of it is, again, finding people with a vision to help attack that problem and then building a community of interest that will volunteer or take a, um, an isolated data set and do it in a protected space, have a, a playground, an experimental zone to work with the data and then change the behavior of how the regulators will allow things to occur. Because in some cases, we're just trapped in an old system that was built a long time ago. And sometimes people forget, well, that's just the way we do things. And it's got to change. There's a project um, that was um, set up at UC Davis uh, six or seven, maybe seven years ago. And Governor Schwarzenegger was the governor of California. And he went out to a bid. And uh, UC Davis won the bid for something called the Energy Efficiency Center. Um, and you can, again, find it on the web. And um, they did some interesting project work around water. Guess, guess what? <laughs> it's, it's the best agriculture school in the country. Um, it's a, a Davis, guess what? A lot, of, a lot of farming in California. And they do a lot with, with fermentation because they fed the wine country up there as well. So they're really good with water and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And, and they started to run some experiments just to understand in a particular uh, zoned space, so a known and defined territory of, of, uh, of a water utility. There are 1,700 water utilities in the state of California. 1,700 utilities that deal with water in this state. Some of them are small wells, more or less, that are private. Some of them are big public utilities owned by shareholders. Some of them are big public utilities, not owned by shareholders. Very complicated on how all that works. So they took, with the professor, civil engineering professor, a data set working with a utility in a particular county in a section of the state and started to analyze the pricing information about water. And it's not going to surprise anyone in the room that the people playing golf at the golf course were not paying for the water. It was the people cutting the lawns. So there's a regulation that says water should cost this much based upon what? The use of the water? I don't think so. So when you start to see these things, then you can go back. Public opinion will rise up. That's why these projects are important. People will say, we need to change the rules. And we need to be thinking about this in a different way. So that's what the civic tech movement's about. So it does, at the end of the day, attack the economic issues and in some cases, the cultural issues associated with that, to the earlier question. Um, but we won't know it unless you can see it and then come up with those kinds of examples. So that's long-winded, but it's just another story about the kinds of problems that using these business intelligence systems and having access to the data and then getting the communities of interest together to say, OK, we're going to go figure this one out. So none of these things are going to turn into a big bang that solves a problem. 
are going to turn into incremental steps, inch by inch. The journey of a thousand miles, you know, starts with a couple of steps. You got to move forward. And the data science, the cost of computing, these cloud systems that make it effectively. You know, when I got started in this business 30, 40 years ago, I mean, even 20 years ago, people were spending millions and millions and millions of dollars of venture capital money to go buy computers to go do a startup to do a few little things. Those millions and millions and millions of dollars right now cost about 10 cents an hour. You know, it's like, it's like you don't need it anymore. You guys get to ride on top of all that as you think about these things. And all these problems can now be attacked because we've got that infrastructure. Couldn't have done it four or five years ago. Couldn't have done it 10 years ago. It would have been impossible. Um, so it's just happening right now. I think yeah, we have time one for one or two more questions. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, first and then there. Hey, um, I just want to hear a little bit more about your vision of the future. I mean, you mentioned the example of a building with uh, like sensors for the, the windows. and Sure. I'm, is there going to be data collection everywhere, even in our urinals? Like, yeah, <laughs> if you want it. Um, yeah, it's a, there are there are issues. Um, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and say, "Here's the way I would like it to be," you know, I would hope that within the privileges that you project, so you as an individual, um, you are the market. You are the market. Right? And um, many of the systems and services that you use take advantage of that. Right? When you're fooling around on the web and clicking and going here and there, people are making money. You're the market. I would like to see a world where you could auction yourself off and say, I'm interested in bicycles, balloons, bean bags, and going to the beach. That's what I care about. Bring me information about those things. Everybody else stay away, right? So there, there might be a world where your privileges are projected, what you want to have come to you. And then the intelligence that's around you penetrates that based upon your priorities, right? And you see some of that in, in the emerging dashboards that we and Google and others are starting to put out, because there's, there's pushback you know, around the world. Witness the so-called Edward Snowden revelations, right? That people have been paying attention uh, without anyone knowing it. And they were sniffing along the cables under sea, and nobody knew, but you can. And so I'm hopeful that uh, in this world, we say, and it comes from our new CEO's uh, mission and broad vision statement for the company around enabling every person, every organization, every entity on the planet to achieve more. It means that the intelligence that's around you, whether it's um, you know, when you're driving your car uh, or when you walk into the room, the computer systems that present information to you, back to my office automation, rational task thing, instead of going to do things, the computers will bring you things. We hope the intelligence and the systems brings you the right things based upon who you are and what your abilities are. Let's just say um, these machines start to listen to you and see you. Are they going to act in one way if your accent suggests something? Are they going to act in another way if the edge detection says, oh, they look like they might be of this ethnicity or what have you. How are the systems going to act? And that will change. You've got a professor here who's uh, very, very, and you're, you're dean in, in, in robotics, and this is edge detection, sounds, images, things of this ilk. That's all going to be happening in, in the very, very, very near term. So I'm hopeful that the systems bring things to you based upon your abilities. So if you're sight impaired or hearing impaired, the systems know and they bring you the right things in the right way, and that you have the ability to tune them so that the, the things that you don't want to have happen are filtered out. So that's what I would hope for, and that's the greater good of technology. The downside is, you know, you're the product, and, and, there's, and, and they're using your trail. Um, anyway, so that's just a, a point of view. Maybe one more. I guess we've got people have another. Hi, thank you for doing this. Um, 
How do you see the transportation infrastructure changing as self-driving? A little bit closer, I can't quite Sorry. How do you see uh, the transportation infrastructure changing as self-driving cars become more prevalent? Yeah. I'm very big on that problem. I think it's going to take a really long time to go big. Uh, I think I think there's a, there's a hype cycle on all of these things. I, I love the fact that, that cities are stepping up and making experimental playgrounds. I love the fact that the government, the federal government and others are saying, okay, hands off, we're going to let it go. Because if we don't run these experiments and let it work, somebody else will do it, whether it's nationally, if you will, you know, it's nation state. You know, we, from the, the U.S., um, the transportation industry is, is, is really the key um, in my mind, particularly as it relates to climate, uh, and that's a big concern. I have the sustainability agenda for the company at a at sort of a macro level. We work with all different parts of the company. And um, the electrification of the U.S. transportation infrastructure with renewables feeding the grid is pretty fundamental because, as you know, we consume a massive percentage of the global energy and we're 5% of the population. Um, and companies like ours and Google and Facebook and Amazon, sort of the big four and, and Apple's small on this front, but they do good things. Um, we are going to be massive energy consumers with the data centers that we have. And we put out some, some data and statistics on that. And, we made public commitments to, to go 100% renewable. So I, I go back to renewables and, and environment because I think that's where, that's, that should be the motivating force. And then it will help with traffic and congestion in a huge way because these cars can run bumper to bumper if they're, if they're under self-control like that. Um, and the efficiencies are, are, are pretty amazing. But you, know, you get outside of uh, sunny San Jose and you go to the snow country um, and it's snowing and where are the white lines on the road and it's, it's a little harder. So I think whoever gets elected in this next election, um, if they don't take on physical infrastructure and retool the infrastructure with sensors, um, we're kidding ourselves because we need that to make it all work. So a uh, good question. All right, great. Okay, thank you so much.